Good morning, everyone. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And immediately after doing that, he created light so that everything that he had done would be visible. Today we have another beginning, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But this beginning is very different than the first one. Whereas the first beginning was so bright and spectacular that no one could miss it, this beginning is so obscure that it is nearly drowned out by all the bright lights of the Roman Empire. But out in the wilderness, there's a prophet that God has sent who's preparing the world for the kingdom that he is about to inaugurate on earth. And for a king, he's about to send who is his own son. Who is this king and what is this kingdom that is coming and is being proclaimed in, in, in total obscurity in the desert? We begin by looking at what does the scripture say about this prophet and this messenger. Mark quotes in verses two and three from two Old Testament prophecies about a messenger who will come before the Lord of hosts and prepare his way. He quotes from Malachi chapter three, verse one, which says, see, I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? And in verse 3, Mark quotes from Isaiah chapter 40, uh, verse 3, which says, A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Both of these passages, apart from the fact that they speak about preparing a way for the Lord, also address God's people under the shadow of empire. In the Malachi passage, we find God's people under the shadow of the Persian empire. And um, even though the Persian empire afforded them a degree of religious liberty, we find them in a position of compromise where they've assimilated themselves to the culture, uh, not just culturally, but also they've taken on uh, some of the uh, detestable practices of that people. We find them in the book of Malachi uh, rampant with adultery and oppression and dishonesty. And we find that the families are falling apart and that the worship of God has been abandoned. And uh, the word of the prophet comes to them at that time uh, previewing the kingdom when God is going to come and uh, have his rule and they would be under his, his, uh, his empire. And then in uh, Isaiah 40, we find God's people in the midst of the Babylonian captivity. And there they're not in a position of compromise, but one of suffering and despair. And they're wondering, can God still hear their prayers with all of uh, the suffering that has been inflicted upon them and they've been taken away from their homes and they've lost everything that they've held dear and that they, they treasure. But regardless of what scenario God's people find themselves in, the word of God comes to us about this kingdom that will come. That even though we are ruled by, by temporal powers, ultimately our king is God. And his intention is that his kingdom shall reign also on the earth and that we shall be, be part of it and even rule with him. One of the most revolutionary passages in the Bible in my opinion, is Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Let me read it for you. It says, In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. <clears throat> so while all the world powers were reigning, they were on the seats of power, they had authority and, <clears throat> and wealth, 
and they could do, it seemed, whatever they pleased. While all this was happening, quietly, the word of God came to um, the son of an obscure priest, a rank-and-file priest, Mr. Nobody from Nowhere, out in the wilderness, um, proclaiming the kingdom of God. Now, um, when I read from Mark, it says that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And um, one of the names that I just mentioned, Tiberius, he was also considered the son of God. He was the, the adopted son of Augustus, who died um, in 14 uh, AD. And at the time that he died, the Senate decided to proclaim him as a king. And then his son, who became emperor, um, he was also received, he received the, the name son of God. But here we have a son of a different God, not of a God who was a man who was made into God, but of, of God who made himself human. So what does all this have to say to us today? The son of God that we worship. Maybe today we don't um, associate our rulers with divinity. But what is the relationship between us and the empires of our day? I think if we bring the passage to our day, we could put it this way. In the waning days of Donald Trump's presidency, when Biden and Harris are preparing to take over control of the free world, when Justin Trudeau was Prime Minister of Canada, and Doug Ford was Premier of Ontario, and John Tory was the Mayor of Toronto, the Word of God came to St. Mary and St. Martha during one of the most difficult times in its history. And what, how, are we, how are we going to respond to that word that comes to us today? I believe there's several steps in, in our passage today that show us how we might respond to that word is, that has come to us. The first way is by agreeing with God's word. In verse 4 of uh, Mark chapter 1, we read, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. This word confession, um, the basic meaning of it is to agree. And uh, I think it, it really helps to understand um, our response to think of it in this way. That if we look at all the times when God has said, that we should do things one way and he's given us his word of what he expects from us and then whether intentionally or unintentionally we have done something different we'll, we'll say i agree that in that in that instance where our wills diverged that you were right and i was wrong let's agree to that sometimes we find ourselves um unwittingly doing exactly what god wants us to do and sometimes we don't feel any opposition to it. But many times, or perhaps even the majority of times, we find a conflict between what we want to do and what God says that we should do. But if we're going to confess and begin the, the process of repentance, it means we have to agree that in those situations, God was right. Um, that God is not the one who needs to change, it's us. The word of God is very clear. It says that God's word is established in the heavens. So that's not what's going to change, but we're the ones who are called to change. And he gives us the power to change as well. He says that by sending his messenger, regardless of, of what's happened in the past, regardless of uh, the times that we've disagreed with him and we've gone our own way, um, and even sometimes with very disastrous uh, consequences, the invitation is forget all that. Just agree with me and confess your sins to me and I'll give you forgiveness. He says in, in the first John, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll give us a fresh start. Today could be day one for, for us in, in this life. We could start fresh with a clean slate and have all our sins forgiven and be cleansed. And the invitation is, is open to us. And all we have to do is humble ourselves and confess that God was right, right and we were wrong. Let's not agree to disagree with God. But let's be in agreement with him in all things. The second way that we can accept this word is to live it, 
It's one thing to say with our, our mouths that we agree with God about our sin and about our lives. But we can't just say that we agree with it. We ought to live in agreement with it. And that's what repentance means. Repentance means turning away from going our own way and following God's way. Um, the example of John the Baptist, I believe, gives some hints about what this might look like. It says in uh, verse 6, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, I think this is quite an extreme way to live, uh, but if we could maybe bring out some of the principles from it, I think he lived a very simple life, and he lived a very distinctive life. He lived very simple because, you know, maybe he wasn't um, wealthy enough to buy a nice clothes, uh, or uh, food, or maybe raise his own animals. So he was going for what was the most uh, cost effective and efficient. But I think the simplicity of the way he lived um, in, in these matters was something that empowered his ministry in the sense that he wasn't tied up with all that was going on in the world. And he was free to be ready for the call of God when it came for him. This will look different for each one of us depending on our situation in life. We don't all have to divest ourselves of all our assets and go out into the wilderness and live a life of, of deprivation and suffering. But we could all find ways to um, not get too entangled in, in the things of this world and what it says that we need and be um, always vigilant and prepared for the time when God calls, calls upon us and um, is ready to use us mightily for his purposes. And I would say he's also living distinctively in the sense that the way he's dressing and the way he's eating, apart from being simple, um, also recall the life of a prophet from the Old Testament, Elijah, who was also um, preaching against the empire at that time of, of wicked kings in, in Israel, Ahab and, and his wife Jezebel. And the way he lived, Jesus said, who did you go out into the wilderness to see? a reed easily shaken by the wind. Um, if you want to see people wearing nice clothes, go to the king's, king's castle. And I think by the way John lived his life, it was evident to everyone that saw him what he was about. And uh, that's why people went out to him because they knew this was someone who was serious about following God. Uh, this is someone who had heard from God and uh, who could guide people in the, in the ways of God. And I think that that's very true for us. We could live distinctively maybe without even speaking a word, just the way we live, um, people will know that um, we've been with God and that when they have questions about serious matters like eternity and life and death, they can come to speak to us because we've lived distinctively and shown what we're about um, just by the way that we're living, by living out the word of God, which has come to us at this time for such a time as this. And, and so the way we live our life simply and distinctively leads seamlessly into, into witness, which I would say is the third way that we respond to God's word that comes to us today, is that we live it. Um, verse 7 and 8 tell us about um, the manner in which, uh, <clears throat> in the manner of, in which John the Baptist uh, witnessed to Jesus Christ. It says, he proclaimed, the one who's more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In John's ministry, one of the most distinctive things about it is that it's always clear who the hero is. It's always clear who the rock star is. Um, in an age when it's possible to become a rock star and a hero, an influencer by being a minister or by sharing the gospel. John the Baptist um, distance him, distances himself from all those things and is passionate just to be um, a messenger, to let Jesus get all the shine and to recede into the background. He said in John's gospel, he must decrease and I must decrease. It was enough for John the Baptist to humbly proclaim the message that God had given him, that a king and someone greater greater than him was coming. He said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Um, 
by all means come and be baptized by me, but I'm just preparing the way for one that is so much greater. And isn't that, isn't that exactly what we do when we baptize people? Is we welcome them into relationship with someone that's greater than us. Um, one of the things that I heard when I was a student in seminary that stuck with me is uh, something that is, was said many times by um, Reverend Annette Brownlee, that the only thing that we have to offer the world is Jesus Christ. And I think John really understood that. Um, so how do we speak about him? How do we share the gospel? Um, the Apostle Paul has some words in, in 2 Timothy that I love so much, and um, I think they're very helpful with, with understanding this. Here's what he says. He says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant that they will repent and come to know the truth, and that they may escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So what he's saying is God promises that when we share the word that he's given to us we could be his agents to do great things we could break chains in people's lives and destroy strongholds but the way we do that is not by fighting people it's not by yelling at people it's not by cutting people with our words it's not by making people look silly for the things they believe but it's by being kind and gentle not quarrelsome not fighting but able to explain what we believe um, with gentleness and, and with winsomeness and, and uh, with, a, with a kind spirit. And by doing that, God will use us as his instruments to break chains in, in people's lives. Um, I think each and every one of us knows someone who is in that position um, and we're praying for them and we want to see them um, set free from whatever is binding them, regardless of what it is. And God is saying, you can be my instruments to do that. We have... He's given us um, a role in, in his work of, of destroying the strongholds of the devil who is, has people captive. Um, but we do that his way. And that's by, uh, with kindness and gentleness. And the power is not from us, but from God. We're ambassadors of him. Um, so some ways that, that we could do this uh, as St. As Mary and St. Martha, um, in, in the coming uh, coming month, we're going to be beginning an alpha course, and we're going to hear more about that later. But a way to very kindly and gently, perhaps, begin the process of deliverance for somebody could be um, saying to a friend or a family member, um, why don't you come with me to alpha at my church? Or it could be just calling up someone we haven't spoken to in a long time and just listening to someone who is suffering because of the pandemic and, and um, all that is deprived us of in terms of fellowship and, and friendship. And by um, kindly and, and gently speaking into people's lives and um, making sure that Jesus is preeminent in all that we say and that he gets all the glory, we could be participants in the great work, work that he's doing um, of, of establishing his kingdom on this world. So perhaps um, in the grand scheme of things today, we are like John in the wilderness, totally obscure. All the bright lights of society, all the movers and shakers are perhaps elsewhere, perhaps in the seats of power. But yet I believe God's word comes to us in the same way as it came to John, to prepare the way for the kingdom of God. And we do this by first receiving that word for ourselves, by agreeing with God about what he says about our lives in this world, by living it out, by repenting each and every day and turning away from our sins and turning back to God um, and agreeing to do things his way. And by sharing the word, sharing the word of God um, with kindness and gentleness and patience and not being quarrelsome, not being known as fighters, but being known as, as lovers. And by doing all these things, we can prepare the way for our great King, Jesus Christ, um, who will come and uh, destroy all the evil systems um, and, and oppressive regimes of our world, um, as Father Murray said last week, that are hiding behind the smiling faces of dictators. Uh, so we look forward to that day, and uh, we can be glad and encouraged that 
we have a great role to play in, in that process of Jesus bringing his kingdom. Um, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the privilege that you've given us um, to be your servants and to be your messengers. We thank you that you have not um, kept us out of, out of this work and you haven't just gone to the powerful and the influential by worldly standards, but that you've come to us, um, a church we can buy um, much suffering this year and by the pandemic. But we know that when we are weak, we are strong because your power will be manifested through us. So we pray that as your word comes to us today, that we'll be prepared to believe what you've said to us and to share that good news with those around us and prepare them for the kingdom of God, that Jesus is coming, the true son of God, um, and that his gracious and kind rule uh, will be reality for us very shortly. So we pray that you would give us courage and give us joy in this work and this task. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.